Section 2 of The Kidnapping of President Lincoln and Other War Detective Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Melodia Carey. The Kidnapping of President Lincoln and Other War Detective Stories by Joel Chandler Harris. Why the Confederacy Failed, Part 2. There was no difficulty in following these instructions. The scheme was simplicity itself, so transparent indeed that even suspicion would pass it by. Before it was carried out, the head waiter had returned to the front, where he stood almost immovable until the activity of the waiters had subsided. In a few minutes, the hilarious guests who had called Flournoy to their table came out. Didn't Hunt say he'd wait for us? asked one as they came out. No, confound him, replied another loudly. He had to go to the telegraph office. He's nothing but business. Put your toll, exclaimed the third. He's fine feller. His voice was somewhat thick. On each side of the door, two men were stationed. They made no display of their presence, but stood in the attitude of men who had met by chance and who had something interesting to say to one another. But they narrowly eyed each guest as he came out. Presently, the last one, a stout, middle-aged gentleman, a well-known habitué of the hotel, sauntered forth and took from the long rack the last hat left, and walked down the corridor to the stairway in the most amiable frame of mind. He had made a big deal at the gold exchange. He had bought the metal for a rise, and greenbacks had dropped several cents on the dollar. As he disappeared, the head waiter came to the entrance and closed one side of the double door. The four men in the corridor regarded one another with looks of mingled surprise and dismay. One of them, the man who had sat opposite to Captain Flournoy at the table, beckoned to the head waiter. Are you closing the dining room? he asked. Not entirely, sir. We close the doors at four. It is now 3.50. The questioner went to the door and looked in. The dining room was entirely empty of guests, and some of the waiters had begun to snip at one another with their towels. What has become of the gentleman who sat at table with me? He asked with some emphasis. There were two, sir, replied the head waiter, deferentially. I mean the one who sat opposite. Major Hunt? Why, he joined the party at another table. But the bottle was moving too fast to suit his taste, sir. You had been there not more than ten minutes when he excused himself. I think he went out before you did, sir. That is impossible, exclaimed the man vigorously. I'm simply giving you my impression, sir, rejoined the head waiter politely. Why, I'll swear, the man began excitedly. Then, as if remembering himself, he paused and stared helplessly. It seems unnatural, sir, that you shouldn't see him come out if you were standing here. The extreme suavity and simplicity of the head waiter were in perfect keeping with his position. He left me a message for his son who's here. Says he, Mac, he always calls me Mac, sir. Mac, says he, when the lad comes in, tell him not to be uneasy if I fail to come in tonight. Tell him, says he, that I'm engaged on some important government business, and tell him to meet me at the custom house at ten tomorrow morning. It's a pity you didn't make an engagement with him, sir, if you're obliged to see him. He's a fine man, a fine man. With that, he turned and went into the dining room. In a few minutes, the door was closed and locked, but the four men in the corridor still stared at one another. Three of them were amazed. The fourth seemed to be amused. Well, what did I tell you? he asked. I've made up my mind to arrest the head waiter, said the one who had questioned McCarthy. This isn't Washington, said the amused one. Arrest him, and in ten minutes you'll have an Irish riot on your hands in which nobody would be hurt but ourselves. Our orders are plain on that score. We can't afford to stir up the population. I suggest a cocktail all around. It'll give us strength to admit that we are mere bunglers by the side of Barnum. I believe you, acquiesced another. He has been here, got what he came for, and is by this time on his way to Washington. It was this belief that shed a faint gleam of light over a prospect otherwise gloomy. Meanwhile, when Captain Flournoy went through the swinging doors of the dining room and found himself in the entryway leading to the kitchen, he was in a quandary as to his further movements. But every step he took seemed to have been foreseen and provided for. He knew that he had talked too freely to the guest who sat at his table, but how could this emergency have been forestalled? He had left his hat on the rack or shelf in the front of the dining room. A waiter presented it to him the moment he slipped into the entryway. 
he was in doubt what course to pursue. An elderly gentleman beckoned to him with a smile. Following this venerable guide, Flournoy went down a short flight of stairs and into an apartment which he recognized as the drying room or the laundry. Thence he went into a narrow corridor ascended three flights of stairs, and was ushered into the apartment which had served as a trap for Mr. Barnum, or, as he chose to call himself, Mr. Amos Barnes. Some changes had been made. Two hours ago the room was bare but for a few chairs and a table, but now there was a bed in the corner, a lounge, and a comfortable-looking rocker. The table held pens, ink, and writing paper, and a brisk fire was burning in the grate. Everything had a comfortable and cozy appearance. After the strain under which he had been, it was not difficult for Captain Flournoy to adapt himself to such circumstances. He drew the rocker before the fire and gave himself up to reflections which, whether pleasing or not, were of a character to engross his mind so completely that he failed to hear the door swing open. Presently a hand was laid on his shoulder, and he came back to earth with a start. The head waiter stood over him, smiling. "'Have a chair, my friend,' said Flournoy. "'You have placed me under great obligations. "'We have had a very close shave, and that's a fact,' remarked McCarthy. "'But you are under no obligations to me. "'It's all in the way of duty.' "'The air, the attitude of an upper servant had vanished completely, "'and Flournoy was experienced enough to know "'that he was talking to a man of the world capable of commanding men. "'I am a head waiter for precisely the same reason that you are a... "'Spy,' suggested Flournoy, as the other hesitated. "'No,' There's a flavor to that word that doesn't suit to my taste. Let's call it scout, or inspector, or better still, military attaché. I am simply a messenger, said Flournoy, modestly. It is your first experience, I imagine, suggested McCarthy. You are a soldier, and you don't relish the undertaking. That is the truth, Flournoy assented. Well, I was a captain in the navy, explained McCarthy, and now I am... "'What, you see me? You are still a captain of the Navy,' said Flournoy. "'The house is your ship, and the dining-room is your quarter-deck.' McCarthy laughed gleefully. "'I have had the same conceit, oh, hundreds of times,' he cried. They talked a long time, touching on a great variety of topics, and found themselves in hearty agreement more often than not. Finally, they drifted back to the matter in hand, and Flournoy confided to McCarthy that one of the papers with which he had been entrusted was of so much importance that he had decided to deliver it in person. Should this document reach Richmond by the 1st of February, he said, the Federal Army will be captured, Washington will fall, and the war will be over by the 1st of May. Are you sure? McCarthy inquired. Quite sure, the other assented. At this, McCarthy ceased to ask questions or to make comments, but sat for a long time gazing in the fire. Flournoy forbore to interrupt his reflections, and the most absolute silence reigned in the room. Presently, McCarthy straightened himself in his chair. The document she left for the committee this afternoon will reach Richmond in five days, he remarked somewhat dryly. They start at midnight. This seemed to be so much in the nature of a suggestion that Flournoy was moved to ask his advice. "'Shall I include this document with the other papers?' he inquired earnestly. McCarthy shook his head slowly and indecisively. "'It's a serious question,' he said. Ten minutes ago, on an impulse, I should have said send it with the rest by all means, by all means. But now, do you know,' he went on, with great earnestness, "'I am getting to be superstitious about this war. Look at it for yourself.' He waved his hand as if calling attention to a panorama spread out on the walls of the room. First, there was Mr. Lincoln. He went to Washington, a country boor. What is he now? Why, he manages the politicians, the officials, the whole lot, precisely as a chess player manages his pieces, and he never makes a mistake. Doesn't that seem queer? Captain Flournoy, gazing in the glowing grate, nodded his head. Some such idea had already crossed his mind. Then there's the first Manassas Bull Run, McCarthy went on. Does it seem natural that a victorious army which had utterly routed its enemy would fail to pursue the advantage? Is it according to human nature? Again, Flournoy nodded. Finally, take into consideration the case of the Merrimack, continued McCarthy. She had barely begun to perform the work that she was cut out to do when around the corner came the monitor. A match and more than a match for her. Does that look like an accident or even a coincidence? 
At this, Captain Furnoy turned in his chair and regarded his companion with a very grave countenance. "'Do you know?' remarked McCarthy, that I had everything arranged to take charge of the Merrimack. It was a very great disappointment to me when it was found that she couldn't be maneuvered to advantage. You think, then, that Providence, Flournoy hesitated to speak the words in his mind. Judge for yourself. You have the facts. I could mention other circumstances, but these three stand out. As an old friend of mine used to say, they toot out like pot legs. But if you think Providence has had a hand in the matter, why call yourself superstitious? Flournoy inquired. "'Twas a convenient way of introducing what I had to say, replied McCarthy. Silence fell on the two for a time. Finally, McCarthy resumed the subject. You say this document will enable the Confederates to win the day and put an end to the war? I do, Flournoy insisted. I believe so sincerely. It embodies plans that cannot possibly be altered because the success of the Federals depends upon them, and it will enable General Lee and the Confederate authorities to checkmate every move made by our enemies on land from now on. Do you know that in the early spring Grant is to be given command of all the Federal forces? That is the least important information the document contains. A truly comprehensive paper remarked McCarthy gravely. It falls directly into the category of Lincoln, Manassas, and the Merrimack, and we shall see what we shall see. You are certain the rest of the papers will reach Richmond safely? Flournoy asked. Those you turned over to the committee? As certain as I am sitting here. Then let us place this other document with them, suggested Flournoy. If you think it best, certainly, said Mr. McCarthy with alacrity. Flournoy reflected a moment. No, I'll carry out my first impulse, he declared. He rose and paced across the room once or twice. Then he turned suddenly to McCarthy. Shall we toss a penny? he asked. No, no, cried the other with a protesting gesture. It is folly to match chance against providence. Then the matter is settled, said Flournoy decisively. It was settled long ago, McCarthy remarked solemnly. The southern soldier looked hard at his companion, trying to find in his countenance an interpretation of his remark. But McCarthy's face was almost grim in its impassiveness. He arose as Flournoy resumed his seat. You will have your supper here, and your breakfast also. Tomorrow morning you may be able to start on your journey. Do you go west or north? Ah, west, but it is a long way round. Did you ever try the Cumberland route? Or Mahundra would know which is the easiest. He advised the western route because I am familiar with it, explained Flournoy. McCarthy bowed, and in doing so became the head waiter again. The deferential smile flickered about his stern mouth, and then flared up, as it were, changing all the lines of the face, and the straight and stalwart shoulders stooped forward a little, so that humility might seat itself in the saddle. I must be going about my duty, sir, he said. I may call to bid you good night. If I should not, may your dreams be pleasant. He bowed himself out, and Flournoy sat wondering at the fortunes of war and the curious demands of duty which had made a spy of him and a headwaiter of Lawrence McCarthy. He mused over the matter until he fell asleep in his chair, where he nodded comfortably until a waiter touched him on the arm and informed him his supper was served. Did you think I had company? Flournoy asked. You've brought enough for Company B of the Third Georgia. Tis a saying, sir, that travel sharpens the appetite, said the waiter, smiling brightly. Then, the third Georgia is Colonel Nisbet's regiment. Tis in Rance Wright's brigade. To be sure, I know him well, sir. Should you be going to Augusti and chance to see James Nagel, kindly tell him you've seen Terence and he's doing well. He's my father, sir, and he thinks I'm in in my prison. How did you get out? Did you take the oath? Bless you, sir. Twas too strong for me stomach. I'll never tell you, sir, whether I escaped by accident or design. Twas this way, sir. I was in the hospital, sir, and when I got stronger, Father Rafferty, seeing my need of trousers, brought me a pair of blue ones. The next day he comes in a barouche along with an officer. He says to me, Terence, here's a coat to go with the trousers, says he. You see the man driving the barouche, says he. Well, says he, when I go inside, he'll fall down and have a fit, says he. And do ye be ready, he says, to hold the horses whilst I send out the doctor, he says. Well, sir, twas like a theatre advertisement. Down comes the man with a fit, and if he had one spasm, he had forty. The horses were for edging away, sir, but I caught him and held him. Take him inside, says the officer, and tend to him, he says. And do ye, my man, he says to me, get up there and drive me back to quarters, he says. How about Father Rafferty, I says. 
Oh, as for that, he says, he'll be took with a fever if Santaris turns out to be a drivelling idiot, he says. I looked at him hard, sir, and he looked at me, says he, duh ye, will ye jive on? It was Captain McCarthy, sir. Flournoy laughed, though he would have found it difficult to explain why. The reason, doubtless, was that such boldness and simplicity seemed so foreign to our complex civilization that they struck the note of incongruity. He is a queer man, he remarked. Queer, sir? said the waiter. Oh, no, sir, not queer. He's simple as a little child. He's a grand man, sir. Nothing less than that. There was no doubt of Terence Nagel's enthusiastic loyalty to his employer. Supper was duly dispatched, the waiter enlivening the meal with many anecdotes of his own experience in the Confederate Army and in prison. Flournoy found that they had many acquaintances in common, and more than once, when Terence was for returning to the dining room, the guest found various excuses for detaining him. But he went at last, after replenishing the fire, and Captain Flournoy sat long before it, wondering over the chain of circumstances by which he had been dragged, rather than led, into his present position. He took no thought of time, and was surprised when he heard a clock in a distant room strike eleven. By the time the sound had died away, a gentle tap at the door attracted his attention, and, following his invitation, Terence Nagel came in, bearing a waiter on which was a bowl, a silver ladle, and three glasses. In another moment the head waiter came in. He had doffed his evening dress with the badge of his position, and with it dropped the air and manner he assumed in the dining room. He was now himself the educated Irishman, a fine specimen of a class that can be matched in few of the nations of the earth. Do you know the day? he asked when, obeying Flournoy's gesture, he seated himself. Yes, replied the southerner. It is Christmas Eve, and hard upon Christmas, said McCarthy. I hope that our Lord who is risen will have mercy upon us all, and help us to carry out all our plans that are not contrary to his own. Amen, responded Flournoy. It was like grace before meat, only simpler and less formal. Remembering the day and the custom we have at the South, McCarthy explained, I have taken the liberty of brewing you a bowl of nog. Twill be a reminder of old times, if nothing else. Flournoy's face brightened. My friend, you seem to think of everything, he declared. The very flavor of it will carry me straight home. Twas no thought of mine. I have a little lass who comes to fetch me toggery in the afternoons. I was telling her of the southern gentleman so far from home, and her eyes filled with tears, and says she, Dada, darling, why not make the gentleman a bowl of nog for his Christmas gift? It is wonderful how thoughtful the women folk are, and how tender-hearted. I'll fill your glass, sir. And yours, insisted Flournoy. To be sure, cried McCarthy, and one for my lieutenant, Terence Nagel. See the lad blush. You'd think he was a girl by the way he reddened. Yet with half a dozen men like him, I could meet a company of regulars. He's overdoing it, sir, Terence protested. He's overdoing it. The lad was so overcome, he dropped the glass on the floor, but the carpet saved it. Were you ever drunk? McCarthy asked, after they had made away with a nog. The inquiry was bluntly put, and Flournoy looked hard at his companion. Yes, once, when I was a youngster of fourteen. It was at a corn shucking, he replied. Well, recall your feelings and actions if you can. Tomorrow morning you must not only be drunk, you must be very drunk. I don't understand, said Flournoy. Tomorrow morning a cabman will be waiting for a fare on the other side of the street, opposite this window. The blinds must be opened early, but someone will attend to that. If the sun is shining, the cabman will take out his watch. The hour will be anywhere from nine to ten. The sun will shine on the face of his watch, and the reflection will be thrown on the wall of your room. If the sun is obscured, you will hear a policeman's rattle. Then your spree must begin, and make it a jolly one. Here is a small pistol loaded with blank cartridges. Use it at your discretion. At the head of the stairs, you will fall into the arms of a big policeman who will be joined by another. Take no offence if they hustle you. A bruise or two won't hurt you. It's all for the good of the cause. But it's our only chance. I can see that you have a temper. Don't lose it with our friends, the policemen. They will have a very critical crowd to play to and must play as if they meant business. I must bid you good night. One moment, said Flournoy. He drew from his pocket a five-dollar gold piece and laid it on the table. McCarthy drew back, his face flushing. What is that for? he asked sternly. It is a Christmas gift for your daughter. For Nora, cried the other. Why, she'll be the happiest lass in the town. His eyes sparkled and his whole manner changed. This must be my real good night, he went on. I have work to do and you will need rest. 
He went out, followed by Terence. Captain Flournoy was up betimes, his plantation habits following him wherever he went, but he was not a man on whose hands time hung heavily. Just now, one of his windows commanded a view of about 20 feet of Broadway, and he watched, with more interest than usual, the fluctuating stream of humanity that flowed through it. When he grew tired of that panorama, he had his own thoughts for company, and the thoughts that are bred by a cheerful disposition are the best of companions. And then he had in his pocket a copy of Virgil. Under such circumstances, only a man with a bad conscience could be either lonely or gloomy. Presently his breakfast came, and by the time Terence had cleared away the fragments, nine o'clock had struck, and the sky, which had been overcast in the early morning hours, was clear. At nine, too, a closed cab came leisurely from the direction of Washington Square and took up its position in the side street opposite the ladies' entrance of the hotel. From behind the curtains, Flournoy watched the driver closely, and never once did the man give so much as a side glance at the upper windows of the hotel. His curiosity seemed to be dead. For a while, he read a newspaper, nor did he cease from reading when a man, passing quickly by, pitched a small valise into the cab. But presently the paper palled on him, and he folded it neatly and tucked it away under the cushion. Then he looked at the sun, and, as if to verify the time of day, pulled out his watch and sprung the case open. The reflection from the crystal, or from the burnished case, flashed through Flournoy's window, and danced upon the wall once, twice, thrice. Now was the time to act, and act promptly, but Flournoy paused and drew a long breath. The whole business seemed to be child's play. He seized his overcoat by one sleeve, slung it over his shoulder, threw open the door, gave a fox hunter's view halloo, the same that is called the rebel yell, fired two blank cartridges, and went staggering blindly along the corridor, crying, There he goes, there he goes, I'll shoot him. Out of the way, and let me shoot him. At the head of the stairs, a policeman loomed up as big as a giant. Come out of this, you maundering devil, he cried. They tell me you've been keeping the house awake the live long night. Be easy or I'll twist your dumb neck, you dribbling idiot. Fling him down to me, Tim, while I whale the jimmies out of him. Tis the second time the howling devil has broke loose the fortnight. This from the policeman at the foot of the stairs. Now, while these policemen were talking, they were also acting. They cuffed Flournoy about between them, and knocked and dragged and bundled him along with a zeal that was almost unbearable. By the time they reached the sidewalk, he was limp and exhausted. But he did not fail to notice that Terence Nagel was prominent in the considerable crowd collected there. Took him to the hospital, Tim. Tis the only way to clear the jibbies from his head. The hospital, cried Terence Nagel. And if he was a poor man, he'd be hauled to the station and be left there. Ain't it the truth, exclaimed the keen-faced, shabby-looking man. Chase it, cried the policeman who had been left behind. Chase it and move on, every living soul of you. By this time, the cab was rattling away up Fifth Avenue. You fellas of heavy hands, said Flournoy to his companion when he had pulled himself together. Faith, we have to limber ye up, Cap. Why, you don't know the ABC ever, Jag. When you landed me one in the jaw, I says to meself, But Dad, if he goes down hitting straight and hard like this, he'll be nabbed by them kinnies at the door, says I. And I tipped the wink to Mikey, and we doubled you up same as gin and improved ardor at Redmond, sir. All we needed to give the job regularity, sir, was the power driver. At 40th Street, the cab halted. The policeman shook hands with Flournoy and got out. And in a very short time thereafter, the latter found himself at the passenger station of the New York Central. He descended from the cab and was about to pay the fare when the cabman lifted his hat with, Good luck to you, sir, touched up his horse and went whirling away. Two weeks afterward, Captain Flournoy, with a companion, a scout who knew the country well, was feeling his way southward through West Virginia. They had good horses, but traveled mainly at night. As they drew near the Virginia line, Flournoy's uneasiness became perceptible. The important document he carried became a burden almost intolerable to him, whereas the scout, one James Kirkpatrick, grew gayer and gayer with each passing hour. While Flournoy was riding gloomily along, Kirkpatrick was whistling or singing softly all the lilting tunes he knew. One night, in a heavily wooded valley, the wayfarers scented danger. They heard a horse whinnying, the clinking of spurs, and the rattling of sabers or carbines. It's the Yanks, said Kirkpatrick. You know this country, you say, queried Flournoy. Like a book, replied the other. Well, here is a paper as important to the Confederacy as Lee's army. Stow it in an inner pocket, and if anything should happen to me, do you ride right on to Richmond. You have the fate of your country in your hands. Phew, whistled Kirkpatrick softly. 
Instantly a voice cried, Halt! Do you save yourself, said Flournoy, and spurred forward, while Kirkpatrick turned to the left, struck a footpath, and went clattering away in the gloom. Captain Flournoy spurred forward and found himself in the arms of the Confederate videttes. In a moment, he heard shots, as of skirmishers firing and falling back. In the distance, they heard the drums beating to arms. Your friend has stampeded a whole Yankee brigade, remarked one of the videttes. But this was a mistake. Kirkpatrick was lying dead not a mile away, killed by a stray bullet. It was his horse, running wild, that disturbed the Federal camp. Next morning, the Federals advanced, feeling their way cautiously. One of their skirmishers, a German, found Kirkpatrick stark and stiff. He appropriated the dead man's overcoat, searched his pockets for valuables, and found the document that was to decide the fate of the Confederacy. He looked at it critically, crumpled it in his hand, and made as if to throw it away. A second thought caused him to cram it in one of his pockets, where it remained until he needed something with which to light his pipe. On the 4th of the following March, Grant was made General-in-Chief of the Land Forces of the United States. and the program set forth in the paper, Grant's move on Virginia and Sherman's march to the sea, was promptly begun and carried out. End of Section 2 Recording by Maria Melodia Carey